All right, welcome back to WCHS, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're going to cover a half of Social 10. Because there really isn't that much that happened this year. Let's get started. What is globalization? You may recall that globalization is the interconnectedness of mankind. If you're currently writing that down because you didn't recall that, you're probably going to fail the test. Because we've been saying it's the interconnectedness of mankind all year. So please don't write down everything today. Only write down what is something that you had forgotten. So you're not going to impress me by writing everything down. Um, you're going to impress me by only taking down what you need to take down. Otherwise, you're going to get very fatigued. So globalization, interconnectedness of mankind. The question should be asked, how do we connect? We call these connection um, types dimensions. And the first day of Social 10, we talked about the economic dimension. And I'm like, hey, what did you have for breakfast? Today, I had bananas. I just ate an apple. Well, I ate half an apple. The bananas I had for breakfast today, not from Canada. Because it turns out we don't really have the climate conducive to growing bananas. So we trade with others. Economic trade with others is a part of economic globalization. Why do we connect with people from Nicaragua and El Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala? We connect with them so we can buy bananas. They connect to us so they can get maple syrup. So one dimension of globalization is economic. And it's no doubt that the dimension that we focused on the most this year. So for the part A next week, when you're writing the A1, the dimension of globalization that will be highlighted on the A1 is economic. When you write the A2, it's mostly about economic globalization. And when we look at the 30 multiple choice questions, the dimension that is most recurring, economic globalization. So this isn't our only discussion about economic globalization. We'll keep talking about nuances of it. But it's definitely the dimension we focused on the most. So economic globalization, buying and selling of products in the global village. Within that, we have the ideas of comparative or competitive advantage. That Canada has a comparative advantage when it comes to the maple syrup industry because we have the climate, the trees that are conducive to, to growing that, to harvesting maple syrup. El Salvador has a comparative advantage with the growing of bananas. So trade is more of a logical relationship. So within the dimension of globalization that is economic, we have comparative advantages. We have other dimensions of globalization though. We have a political dimension of globalization. And under the political dimension of globalization, to some extent we have this global contest between democracy and non-democratic forces. So we have the global spread of democracy and we have the global spread of non-democratic forces. So we have countries like the United States that try to promote democracy and we might have more authoritarian countries that try to promote dictatorships and totalitarian regimes. Maybe most famously today, North Korea, not a democracy. So in the political dimension of globalization, when people connect globalization, what might they do? They might discuss about politics. What is the role of government? What is the role of citizen? When they discuss politics, they might try to exchange ideas about how political systems should be structured. Democracy or non-democratic? Included in this idea of political globalization is human rights. And we had a lesson on human rights, about the evolution of human rights, about key moments like Hammurabi's Code, key moments like the French Revolution, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, so there's also, within the political dimension of globalization, there's also this, this story, our story, of the evolution of human rights. 
We have social globalization. So when people connect, what might they talk about? They might talk about things like, how do we relate to each other on an individual basis? How do men and women relate to each other? That was, that was a topic of conversation for centuries. You know, what is the role of women in society? What is the role of a woman in a family? What is the role of a man in a family? That's social globalization. What's the difference between a man and a woman? Well, in the 21st century, as we have not just connected, but we've hyper-connected, we have 8 billion people connecting now, we've seen an evolution of the thinking of social globalization. Not only have we seen women achieve equality, we've also seen the redefining of gender. We've moved past what is the role of a woman in society, and now we're talking about what is a woman? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? What is gender? Can gender be fluid? What are different genders? This is a part of a social dimension of globalization. Within the social dimension of globalization, we might also have aspects of how do we relate to each other based on ethnicity. So civil rights movements would, would fall under this dimension. The dimension of globalization that came up sometimes, but not as often, was religious globalization. You know, some people in that gold, God, and glory, they were motivated by God. So there was a nuance of religious globalization this year. Why do we connect with others? To spread the light of Christ. We go to Africa to, to spread scripture, to introduce Christ to, to people that have been living in isolation. But that was not the main theme of the course. Another dimension of globalization has been cultural globalization. When we connect with others, we might have an influence on cultures. And we see that on page 58 of the textbook. And we also see that as we segue down into what is identity. So I'm going to talk about this part, and then I'm going to come back to this. So in terms of cultural globalization, when two groups meet, we see what is called acculturation. Acculturation is when there's an exchange. A meets B, and you know they figure out how they're different and how they're the same. They talk. They talk about their values, their beliefs, their worldview, their assumptions about human nature, role of government, role of citizen, about, about religions and gods and purpose in the universe. As a consequence of acculturation, one group might simply disappear. They might be absorbed. We call that assimilation. A meets B. Now you got two A's. That's assimilation. Assimilation can be very controversial because in that you have a loss of identity. And when you lose identity, culturally, you may lose a lot of history. You may lose, um, in that loss of worldview, we may lose a lot of understanding. Historically, there's been many incidences of assimilation. Linguistic assimilation is very common in our classroom as we are speaking English. The opposite of assimilation might be seen as accommodation. A meets B. And they're like, you know what? We can make room for you. You can still be B. We've got room for Bs over here. So in Canada, in the RCMP, a part of the uniform is the Stetson. But we accommodate people that have a cultural attire that they're meant to wear some other piece of headgear. We're like, you know what? We'd like you to be an RCMP officer. You know, it'd be cool if you wore a Stetson, but we understand that in your culture, you already have a piece of head attire. You know what? You can wear that and still be an RCMP officer. That's accommodation. It's different than assimilation. Now, another term that we use to describe the cultural impact that we can have on each other is homogenization. Homogenization, sometimes we use the term Americanization or Westernization. Homogenization is becoming more evident in the world. 
The easiest term is global sameness. Sameness. You look around and you just see everything's the same. That's homogenization. Now, some people might say this is a good thing. If we create one global culture, then we'll have global unity. It's only through global unity we can overcome our global challenges. Because we have shared challenges like global health concerns, global climate concerns, global poverty, global um, people just basically living in apathy and disinterest, maybe it's homogenization is the solution. You know, there is a lot of strength in, in unity. That's the core of fascism. Uh, but there are many people that look at homogenization and they're like, but that creates so much less interest. The reason why we want to travel is we want to go experience something different. We don't want to go to Paris and go eat at Tim Hortons. We don't want to go to Rome and go to Pizza Hut. You know, we want to see diversity, not homogenization. So one of the dimensions of globalization is cultural. And there's some key terms on page 58. Now, what is identity? Well, we have individual identity. I'm Ross McBride, but I also have a collective identity. I'm Irish Canadian. I, you know, I live in Wetaskiwin, um, or, or wherever it is I live, you know, in this imaginary world. Maybe I'm a, I'm a frustrated Oilers fan. That's part of my collective identity. I belong to Oilers Nation. And like most who belong to Oilers Nation, we're a little frustrated. But I'm still, that's still part of who I am. Well, sometimes globalization can change our identity. And we have a story coming out of the 1970s with the Lubicon Creek. 1973, there was a war in Israel between the Israeli Jews and their Arab neighbors. And the Jewish people of Israel were attacked during the religious holiday of Yom Kippur. Nearly defeated. But somehow the Jewish people won the war. And therefore the Arab people that attacked them, they said, well, the Jewish people must be getting help from someone else. Probably the Americans. We need to punish America. We can't do it militarily because they're a superpower. Let's do it economically. Let's stop trading oil. And America and her allies that are addicted to oil as the lifeblood of their modern economies, they will see hyperinflation that will destabilize their economies and lead to economic, social, and political chaos. And that's what they did. As a consequence of that, America and her allies needed more oil. So they go to areas, close to areas, where they found oil. We found oil in Leduc. Let's go a little further north and see if we can find some more oil. We found oil in Peace River. Let's go a little further south little further east and west and north, see if we can find oil. Well, when they do that, they bump into Lubicon Cree territory. Lubicon Cree at this time were living a very traditional lifestyle. Trapping, fishing, hunting, self-sufficient. They didn't need Ottawa at all in their lives. They were not struggling. They were thriving. But when the oil uh, industries come in, exploring, looking for oil, making roads, disrupting the animals that the Lubicon Cree were living on, now the Lubicon Cree were no longer self-sufficient. They couldn't hunt, trap, and fish their way into um, you know, comfortable quality of life. They needed to ask Ottawa for help. That changed their identity. That's globalization, creating a butterfly-like effect. Something that you're unaware of. The Lubicon Cree don't even know who the Jewish people are. They don't know the Arab people. But because of that, it changed their identity. Next main topic that we kind of talked about was, was the media. So I have something here about the media, but I'm going to really focus on this. The media is meant to be a watchdog in a democracy. What does that mean? If I come to your house tonight, I come to your house to, you know, to steal your car, steal your, your quad. I come to your house tonight to, to break windows because that's fun. And you have a dog. It's probably your job's, the job of your dog to start barking. Sound the alarm, right? Something's wrong is happening. That's a watchdog. The media is meant to be a watchdog in a democracy. We have nearly 40 million Canadians, some living thousands of kilometers away from Ottawa. It's hard for us to look into government every day. 
So the media looks into government for us. And when something's wrong, they're meant to sound the alarm. Justin Trudeau is committing a crime. Justin Trudeau is lying to the people. Justin Trudeau's government has you know, spent billions unaccounted for. That's the media's job, to keep an eye on government, to question government, hold them accountable, make sure government is fulfilling the will of the people. In a dictatorship, in a non-liberal state, in a non-democratic state, the media would be an instrument of government. Adolf Hitler used the media to shape the minds of his citizens. We call that an instrument of indoctrination, instrument of control. So he spoke to the people through the radio and said, this is my vision for greater Germany. And the media, because it was controlled by government, had to obey Hitler's wishes and sell that, that narrative. Well, in a free democracy, the media shouldn't be selling a narrative of government. They should be questioning the, go the government, holding them accountable. That's the watchdog thing. But the problem is, your dog's loyalty has been compromised. I come to your house tonight, and because your dog is more loyal to me than you, your dog's not going to bark when I get there. Your dog's actually happy that I get there. And I'm going to come, and I'm going to steal your quad. I'm going to break a few windows. Oh, you're not here. I'm going to go in now. I'm going to steal some more stuff. Your dog's loyalty has been compromised. Our dog, the media's loyalty, has been compromised. They are the lapdog of their corporate owners. Because instead of having thousands of independent newspapers in Canada, we have a few very large newspaper companies that all are reporting to the same type of person. Therefore, we're only getting one type of story. The newspaper was meant to be very liberating. You know, anyone can create a newspaper and spread what they see is to be the truth. But instead, newspapers, TV stations, internet sources, it's been compromised by the elite. And because of that, we are being manipulated. So we saw that story when we looked at Fox News in Florida. There's a group of people called the investigators, investigative journalists. They're going to be like those who broke the story where Watergate said something's wrong. They're breaking the story that Monsanto was selling a product, RBGH, that had no purpose. Because the world was awash in milk and was creating problems for cows and problems for people drinking it. And Fox News said to the investigators, the investigative journalists, you're not allowed to be a watchdog. You have to be my lapdog because... I just bought these radio stations. I just bought these TV stations. And Monsanto is one of our main customers buying ad space. So we're not going to run a story that shows them to be creating a product that's dangerous. Because then they'll pull their ad space and I'll lose millions of dollars. Our loyalty is to money, not to public health. Laptop. Many times in America, and increasingly so in Canada, we see media that's actually now an attack dog. A lapdog can be directed towards an enemy. Trump, Biden, Republicans, Democrats, people who believe in the vaccination, people that are anti-vax, people that believe in equality, people who believe in inequality, the Proud Boys, Black Lives Matter, these activists, those activists, these people, those people, white people, non-white people. Boom! They just keep dividing us and pushing us as uh, or trying to convince us to attack each other. That's the idea of attack dog. We see it during elections. Rather than one party saying, this is my platform, they're like, this is why you shouldn't vote for the other person. They focus on the negatives of their candidate, or the, sorry, their, their opponent, rather than the positives of their own platform. Ultimately, I would argue that the media has now become a clown. The real purpose of media today is to distract us. We live in the matrix, and we just don't understand it. That there's more important stories out there, but we keep getting distracted with fear. So that's the story about the media. 
And we talked about transnational media because, again, there's maybe eight media conglomerates that control the majority of global media. And people look at the media and they believe that what they read or what they see is the truth because we're not critical analytical people. We're puppets. We're Muppets. So if you leave here knowing one thing, hopefully you leave here to just say, you know what, maybe I should question stuff. Because that is important. So that's the part on the media. Next up we have more on economic globalization. If oil is the lifeblood of the modern economy, then within our blood, you know, the body, our body is like the global village, our our, our blood is, is oil, um, but what's moving stuff around? You know, what's moving little white blood cells and red blood cells and things around? That's containers, containerization. We have containerization. 95% of world trade is because of containerization. We watched a short little video, a little TED talk, I believe, about how a guy named McLean, a, a truck driver from New Jersey, invented containers. How can we ship so many products at great distances through containerization? It, it speeds up world trade because it speeds up the, the ability to load and unload and to inspect products at every border. And without containerization, we couldn't have a global economy of $65 trillion a year. Now within that global economy, we have two main types of trade, fair and free. What is free trade? I want to go back to Adam Smith. Adam Smith said the wealth of a nation would grow if government would remove itself from the marketplace. If we were free of government. So what does free trade mean? Trade free of government. So if I want to buy a wine from Italy or Portugal or France or Chile or Argentina or Australia, I should be able to buy the wine, pay shipping, that's it. But what governments often do is they involve themselves in the transaction. They tax it. They're like, well, Russ McBride, we don't want you buying Chilean wines. We want you to buy Okanagan wines. So to discourage you from buying Chilean wines and to encourage you to consume locally, we're going to tax that product at the border. There's a tariff. So the wine you're bringing in from Chile is $40 a bottle. You're going to pay a 50% tax on it at the border, 20 more dollars to bring it in. Is that wine worth $60 plus shipping for you so that you don't buy something from Kelowna Wines? That's a tariff. That's taking freedom from the trade. So what is free trade? It's basically global capitalism. We still have government regulating trade. We still have government taxing trade, but there's a movement towards free or trade. We call it trade liberalization. Instruments within that are the IMF and World Bank. We'll see more of that next day. So what is fair trade? The textbook talks about the banana industry. We also talked about chocolate. Sometimes when you consume coffee or a chocolate bar, there might be a little, a little label on it that says this is a fair trade product. What does that mean? It means that instead of getting that product to you at the lowest cost, trying to get that product to you at the fairest cost. What is fair to each person along the supply chain? Historically, it's the people at the beginning of the supply chain that were being most exploited. The pickers, the growers. Fair trade means you're going to pay a little bit more for that coffee or chocolate bar, but the pickers, the growers, should have a livable wage. They shouldn't be working in slave-like conditions. That's fair trade. Companies that uh, engage in fair trade might be trying to display their global citizenship. You know, Tim Hortons might say, you know, we have fair trade coffee. It's part of their global citizenship. I think I've talked about all these concepts. The morning class wanted a little more clarity about economies of scale. Tasman Composite High School has 900 students on a good day. We have most of our students here today. 
Because we have 900 students, we offer physics and calculus and French. Because Pigeon Lake has less students than 900, there's programs we offer that they cannot. Because Buck Mountain has less students than Pigeon Lake, Pigeon Lake has some programs that Buck Mountain cannot offer. But let's be clear. If you went to Harry Ainley, where there's 3,500 students, you'd have more options. Oh, you want to learn German. Well, you can learn German at Harry Ainley. Because there's more students. There's an economy of scale. If you go to New York, there's restaurants that are fantastic, but they wouldn't be viable in Wetaskiwin because there's not enough consumers in Wetaskiwin that would want that type of food. So in, in places like Toronto and Tokyo and New York, you have so much variety because they have so many consumers that can demand that. That's an economy of scale. So I think we're done those first three, first four actually. Now what is the controversy surrounding globalization? If you go to lesson five, not now because we don't have our Chromebooks out, but if you go there, lesson five was really about teaching you how to do an A1. Lots of cartoons, lots of sources to analyze. And key to an A1 is trying to look into a source and see, are they exposing a problem within globalization? Because the first related issue of the year is about cultural globalization, most of those um, sources from Lesson 5 expose culture clashes. You know, when two groups meet, you're not always going to have a, a accommodation. A won't always make room for B. There might be some ideas that can't coexist. One group believes in human rights, another group believes in cannibalism. Those two things cannot coexist. So, Within Lesson 5, we talked about the controversy surrounding globalization. When we connect with others, what might be some problems that come up? Americanization, westernization, imposing our values, imposing liberalism. The ideas of ethno and, and Eurocentrism. The idea of white man's burden. This idea that we need to, we need to enable others or, or help others. Somehow that something is inferior to what we're doing. Having said that, there are some universal truths, like cannibalism's bad. And that's what makes it controversial. Because sometimes we do need to impose our values. What you're doing is unacceptable. So the controversy surrounding globalization is connected to identity, connecting to cultural consequences, but there is economic side too. And the economic side certainly going to be big in your A1 next week. When we talk about global capitalism, what we're seeing is inequality at a global scale. Today we talk about the 1% and the 99%, the haves and the have-nots. We have individuals worth in excess of $300 trillion, no, sorry, $300 billion, uh, depending upon what Tesla's trading at today. They had a good day yesterday. We have other individuals, including people in our town, that are homeless. We have people that will die this winter because of a lack of heat, a lack of food, a lack of water. It has been said that someone on our planet dies every five seconds because of a lack of clean water. That is global disparity. And a controversy in globalization is this gap between rich and poor this disparity. That capitalism seems to celebrate some, seems to reward some, and punish the many. And we saw that Karl Marx looked into that and said that this would lead to an epiphany by the many, by the workers, by the proletariat, to rise up, violently take over the means of production, the factories. Uh, spark a civil war, yes, but they'll win it because they control the factories. And then create a dictatorship of the workers, lead to a paradigm shift in the hearts and minds of the people, away from selfish individualism towards collectivism. That's the controversial part of economics, is, is global capitalism humane, economically and socially? And is it sustainable environmentally, is something you'll be able to talk to me about next week on Part A. Also with regards to Part A, all essays 
And to some extent, all A1 sources provide a window into a conversation about nature mankind. In your essay next week, you need to address if this, then what. If you don't, you will fail your essay. The essay prompt that you're going to get next week is going to have a claim about the nature of mankind either explicitly said or implicitly there. If this, then what? If mankind is aggressive, if mankind is violent, if mankind is irrational, if mankind is exploitive, if mankind is lost, apathetic, then what? What kind of government, what kind of relationship should we have with each other? What kind of relationship should, should governments have with each other? Should we have one global government? Do we need to be controlled? Do we need citizens to be obedient to the state? Or do we need to be free of the state? Do we need global anarchy? So at heart of your essay will be some observations about the nature of mankind. Now, it's not as simple as saying, oh, you know what? mankind's pretty creative. They're innovative. You have to say, these are the case studies that show mankind's creative. Mankind's innovative. Let's look at how individuals, who if one follows the, the breadcrumbs of the theory of evolution, we began as a pretty minor player on the Serengeti, not even apex predators. We had to go and, and literally feed on the bones that were left by the, by the higher predators in the, in the food chain. We had to find a way to get nutrition out of the bone by harvesting fire. By controlling fire and then we had to find a way to make food more predictable by controlling crops basically becoming farmers domesticating livestock so you could look at history for evidence that were innovative that we had problems and we solved them or you can go through your your case studies of the course and say how many case studies do I have that, we're, that show that we're selfish, that we're aggressive, that we're expansionist, that we're violent, that we're irrational, that we're short-sighted? All of these things. This is what you need to do in preparation for the essay. What kind of message do we have about the nature of mankind based upon what we studied? And what does that mean for our future? We have challenges in 2022. We have economic challenges, poverty. We have economic challenges, resource depletion, people without water and food. We have social challenges, inequality, political challenges, authoritarianism. We have political challenges in terms of governments that are manipulating and controlling people. We have environmental challenges. Can we overcome these based upon our nature of mankind? And if, if so, how? Prepare for that and you'll be prepared for your essay. So this, this thing, Nature of Mankind, that's going to bleed into your essay. That if you're not prepared to talk about that, you're not prepared for your essay. You can kind of make some stuff up in your essay. Right? And then you got two days, so then you freak out after the, the first day and you go home and do some research. But I'm telling you a week in advance that lesson six is all about essays, right? Now, let's jump to lesson seven. Ancient globalization. I was reading the book Sapiens, so we began this unit by looking a little bit about the, the you know, unique story of our species. But really, in terms of the multiple choice, you might see something about the Neolithic Revolution. Now, we have this on here, and in the package that I shared with you, uh, there's a YouTube video of a gentleman that can pronounce it better than I can. I don't want to touch anything because it's probably going to stop recording if I do that. But the reason why that's on there is the oldest buildings that we're aware of are temples. So one theory about why we sat down, the Neolithic Revolution, was because of a, a new understanding of our purpose in the universe. Religion. We found religion. So that's one theory. We sat down because different, different clans, different families, different tribes that had been nomadic, they found some kind of religion and they wanted to coexist. They wanted to talk about it. 
But when we look into what happened at those temples, it wasn't just talking about God. There was a lot of economics happening there. So another reason for sitting down was to facilitate trade. These people have stuff we don't have. I want that stuff. I could kill them. That's dangerous. Why don't we just start trading? So economics played a big factor in this too. The Neolithic Revolution will, will lead to the creation of city-states and empires. And what we see is the building of the Silk Road. And Silk Road will be on the multiple choice. It's one of those critical versions, I would say the first version of, of a true globalization, interconnectedness of people. And the unique thing is you have Romans in the West connected to the Chinese people in the East, and they, they're not even connected directly. There's middle kingdoms and empires in the middle, like Persians, that are connecting them. And, and I think that that's a great example of globalization. Because the Romans were connected to the Chinese, you may remember, it leads to the fall of Rome, because the Romans were exporting so much of their wealth to China to import silk. Because they didn't have a balance of trade, they end up seeing the fall of Rome. We also see the fall of Rome because the Romans were no longer so much Roman. That because the empire had expanded so much, they had included so many new tribes that people stopped identifying collectively as Roman and started having competing loyalties. We also see the fall of Rome because of political uh, corruption, political division. And we studied the fall of Rome because we see a similar fall potentially coming paralleling in, in America. We also studied during the ancient globalization time period, what are cornerstones of civilizations? And I wanted you to think about role of government, role of citizen. In Sparta, the role of citizen was to obey the state, the city-state of Sparta. The role of citizen was to serve Sparta. How do you serve them? As men, militarily. Soldier first. In Athens, they had a different vision. And these visions created a segue into a later topic of ideology. In Athens, they promoted a, a form of democracy for Athenian men that owned property. And again, we did this to show different ideas about how the world should be. It also gave us a chance to look at the Spartan quote, strong do what they can, the weak suffer what they must. That's the idea of realism. So what gives you the right to do it? Well, because I have the power to do it. Might is right. That if you have the power to do something, it makes the consequences justifiable. That's a very realist way of seeing the world, but it's also a very limited way of seeing the world. Eventually, we lead to uh, jump from historical to, sorry, ancient to historical globalization. And again, the idea is that Europeans see that the central economic hubs of the world were India and China, and they needed to deal directly with them. They were losing so much money to the middle kingdoms and empires in the, in the transactions that Europeans wanted to get there and be able to trade directly. So they tried to get around Africa, but Africa is a huge continent, very dangerous. So you know when they had to go to shore, they'd go to shore, and a lot of the time they'd get killed by the locals. So going south to go east didn't work. Going north wasn't working because there's a lot of ice. So they tried to go west to get east. And Columbus goes west to get east, and he discovers the new world. And this will lead to the Columbian exchange. Columbian exchange has to be on the multiple choice, right? This is globalization. You know, what is it? It's an exchange of ideas. It's an exchange of goods. You know, horses come to the new world. Potatoes go back to the old world, changing both cultures. It's also an exchange of people. A part of the Columbian exchange would be the slave trade. It's the exchange of disease. Millions will die because of the Columbian exchange, but also millions more will live. It's also the beginning of the word imperialism. We use the word imperialism so much during historical globalization, we stop using the word globalization. It's just mostly about imperialism. So 
we have to really look at why were people globalizing at this time? Gold, God, and glory. That's why they were doing it. Mostly gold and glory. God for some people. Dr. Livingston goes to Africa because of God. You know, he goes into Africa to serve his captives' needs, right? He goes there, spread medicine, spread the light of Christ. He was one of few that was there for God. Most were there for gold and glory. The Spanish conquistadors. Literally gold, right? Cortes, gold. Pizarro, gold. And, and the glory of conquering these new vast territories. So what is imperialism? It's the domination of one group by another. The reason for exploring was to try to be able to have a, a more favorable exchange with the Indians and, and the Chinese. And eventually, because they believe in the zero-sum theory, it's going to lead to mercantilism. Zero-sum theory, I believe, is down here a little bit further, but I'm going to mention it now. So during this age of empires, age of imperialism, there's going to be rivalries formed. The British and the French, the Portuguese and the Spanish. And typically, the rivals will believe, if, if I'm to win, I can't allow my rival to also win. I can only win if they lose. So the British are making money from the 13 colonies, which are now, you know, become the foundation of the United States of America. But then the 13 colonies, they want to trade with France. And the British, thinking of the zero-sum theory, said we can't allow our colonies to trade with France, so they go to war with the colonies. The zero-sum theory. I can't allow my opponent to also win at the same time. Very limited way of seeing the world, yes. Very simple. So I can only win if you don't also win. If I get a billion dollars, but you also get a billion dollars, we're still relatively the same position we were in the beginning. Rather than celebrating that I'm now a billionaire, I'm like, well, I, I haven't gotten further ahead of you. That's the zero-sum theory. So in the age of imperialism, we have a lot of these exclusive mercantilist zones. Mercantilism, you can only trade with England. India, only trade with England. 13 colonies, only trade with England. Now, we're going to focus on three areas of imperialism, China, Africa, and India. But do go into your textbook and look at the stories of Canada and the United States. They do a better job than I do. That's why I left those sections for the textbook. Let's go to India, where the, where the um, business, right, the pound, if you will, uh, was there before the, the flag. The British East India Company was there first. They ran into some trouble with locals. Then the flag had to come. British East India Company was there. Locals thought that they were corrupting them. They put some of the officials in the black hole of Calcutta. News got back to London. People freaked out the English sent the, the empire, the army, to come protect their interests there. India becomes a colony. Not all Indian people want it to be a part of the colony. They want autonomy. They want self-determination. They want independence. So we have the story of Gandhi. And in the story of Gandhi, we see non-violent, non-cooperation. We see protests. We see activism. And we see a, a, a contest of public opinion that the British leave India eventually because the world is beginning to look at the British as not justifiably there. That the white man's burden doesn't apply anymore. Even though the white man's burden, written by Rudyard Kipling from India as a British colonial, by the mid 20th century, people don't agree with that anymore. That you're not helping them, you're hurting them. The story in India is controversial. Because I would argue that there is some cultural inheritance in India. And this is controversial because India was plundered. Tens of billions of dollars of resources were sent back to England. So they were plundered. And they lost some of their culture. But they also inherited some English things. English language, democracy, train system, ports, hospitals, modern medicine, that... 
would help India become a modern nation state. We also looked at imperialism in China. So once the Westerners get to China, the Chinese had always had a world view that we're number one. But then the Westerners get there, and the Westerners have a military edge. And now the Westerners can dictate the terms of trade. This doesn't sit well with the Chinese worldview of being the most important, the most powerful people on earth. So the Chinese and the British have a conflict about you know, what should be traded and how it should be traded. It's called the Opium Wars. The British easily win. And this forces the Chinese to rethink their worldview. It's very humbling. It's humiliating. It's the century of humiliation. But some would say it's a catalyst for change. It's the epiphany that they needed to wake up to reality that they weren't the most important people on earth. That they had fallen behind. That they're, they'd become stale and stagnant and, and, and some of their traditions had to be rethought. Lastly, we can look at imperialism in Africa. So why 1880s? Well, why not the 1680s? Well, honestly, in the 1680s, Europeans could not have colonized Africa. They tried. They got, they got slaughtered, the Europeans did, on the beaches. We didn't have the weapons to make an in-ground. In we needed the mechanization of warfare that only the Industrial Revolution unlocked. We needed machine guns, Gatling guns, to be able to defeat the African tribes, some of them very militant like the Zulu, so that we could get some inroads and control them. So that's why it happens then. It also happens then because the rest of the world's been claimed and you have a scramble for empires. The Germans want their place in the sun. The British want more. The French need to, need to be the equals of the British. So we have a scramble for Africa for glory, but we also have a scramble for Africa for God because there are some that were going to Africa, like the aforementioned Dr. Livingston, to spread the light of Christ. But glory and gold seem to be the two most ones. Now, gold sometimes literally was gold, but for King Leopold of Belgium, gold was rubber. And he needed rubber to fuel the Industrial Revolution. So why in the 19th century? Well, because they had the weapons to do it, but also because of the Industrial Revolution, they needed more resources. Controlling others is going to become less, um, well, politically correct, I would say, at the end of World War II. It's hard for the Dutch to have an empire after they've been occupied by the Germans hard for the French to have an empire after they've been occupied by the Germans and they're crying for self-determination. So as a consequence of World War I and World War II, the taste for empires is, is lost a little, but the desire for independence grows a lot within those who had been formerly occupied. And those who fought in World War I and II, even if they won, they're often, they leave those wars weaker than when they entered. They no longer had the ability to control places around the world. So we have this age of decolonization, which is when these areas become independent. We saw some political cartoons that showed that decolonization often meant taking a foreign master and just replacing it with a, a new local master. All right, so we don't have a lot left. We have some less than 13 and 14. I can probably do this in 10 to 15 minutes. And then thank thankfully give you the last 10 minutes to kind of look over what you have to see if you have any questions for tomorrow. So we are going to power through. So with regards to the Industrial Revolution, be ready to respond to sources about the exploitation of children. That again, you're going to look at the disparity, the inequality, the idea of robber barons that the, the bourgeoisie become new rich, nouveau riche, by robbing the wealth from their workers, exploiting the most vulnerable in society like children. And within that,
conversation, there's the idea of well, what should be the role of government here? Should the government pass legislation to protect the people? Protect the workers? That's what a chartist might say. That's what a, a somebody who believes in democracy might say. But Marx might say, the government's been compromised by the bourgeoisie. We need a violent revolution. The workers need to have an epiphany. They need to break off the chains of oppression, take over the factory. Create a dictatorship of workers, dictatorship of the proletariat. Create a, a paradigm shift in the hearts and minds of the people. We had Robert Owen, who tried to be the government for his workers, provide them a just wage, a livable wage, provide them affordable housing and leisure activities and education for their children, holidays and all these other incentives. So within the idea of the Industrial Revolution, we see roles of government and citizens. Who should protect those that cannot protect themselves, those being exploited? And within that, we have all of these ideologies that pop up. So what is an ideology? It's the way you see the world. It's the world as it was, the world as it is, and the world as it should be. That's your ideology. It's how you make sense of history. It's the things you like about today, and it's the way you want to see tomorrow. That's your ideology. And we've studied many ideologies this year. Individualists believe in promoting the one over the group. It should be my, my personal choice to either mask or not mask. That's individualism. I don't put the collective ahead of the, the one. I put me ahead of you. So if I want to drive my Volkswagen Beetle 160 kilometers an hour because it's a Beetle that can do that in a school zone, so be it. It's my choice. If I want to have my rowdy friends over and we're going to have a party and it's too loud for you, I don't care. It's my choice. If I want to go seal hunting, club them baby seals, maybe write a little message in the snow with their blood, it makes me happy. I get to do it. Individualism. Obviously, I'm painting the negative side. Individualism is the heartbeat of, of the world today. You know, uniqueness, creativity, all of these great things. It's because of individualism that we've unlocked so much of human potential. It's not because of collectivism that, uh, you know, Edison or Tesla or Einstein, you know, ended up inventing the ideas that they did. It was because of individualism. It's under individualism that we thrive. Uh, but we need to know the difference. Collectivism, you put the group first. Collective interest, collective responsibility. You know, I sure would like to have, you know, a bigger house, but that's bad for the environment, so I'll have a smaller house. Collectivism, the common good first. Individualism, everybody's unique. Everybody's, you know, everybody should be allowed to do whatever makes them feel good. Again, that's an oversimplification because I'm angry, but individualism and collectivism. We also have liberals, conservatives, radicals, and reactionaries. <laughs> liberals believe in progress. They believe in change. Conservatives like the status quo. I like Edmund Burke. You know, Edmund Burke is a classic conservative, and when I think of conservatism, I think of Edmund Burke. We live in a great chain of being. Ross McBride is here because of the sacrifices of my ancestors. And I should honor them. That I shouldn't betray them with a sudden shift in the values that our collective DNA share. That's conservatism. Honoring traditions. Honoring values. Can we change? Of course we can change. But let's not change so quickly that it creates chaos. Let's think about it. So we don't betray all the people that have allowed me to be here. Liberals, let's look into change. Let's try something different. Liberals and conservatives both can be quite moderate. And we can be liberal on one idea and conservative in another. You know, if I took a political compass, no doubt I would be both. 
Radicals and reactionaries, they're a little more extreme. A radical is someone that so wants change, they're frustrated it's not happening, they're willing to kill to, to make it happen. I so want something new to happen. So historically this was communism. We hadn't had communism before. People that so wanted communism that they went out and killed people for it, they're radicals. Reactionaries are people that are violently committed to recreating the old. I think that the time of the 7th century, the time of Muhammad was fantastic. Islamic fundamentalism, let's use violence to recreate the time of Muhammad. So we have liberals, conservatives, radicals, and reactionaries. When Benito Mussolini in the 1920s created a fascist government in Italy to recreate the glory of the Roman Empire, that's reactionary. We talk about capitalism. What is social Darwinism? Social Darwinism is when, when some people took the science Darwinism, the theory of evolution, and tried to use it to fit their narrative that some people are better than others. They try to use the science of Darwinism to fit into ethnocentrism. They tried to claim that because different tribes of mankind have been living in, in, in isolation from other tribes for so long, we evolved differently, much like the blue-fitted boobies on Galapagos Islands. Some people had to respond to the cold winters of northern Europe. They had to compete with each other. So Europeans are the strongest. Well, social Darwinism has been proven wrong. But 100 years ago, it was very popular. People believed it to the extent that they were trying to euthanize or try to sterilize people that didn't belong to the genes that they wanted to procreate or reproduce. Utilitarianism, let's do what best serves the group. Everybody should do what they're best at. You know, in, in a baseball team, you might have a player that's a utility player, that they can kind of play any position. Utilitarianism, you have to kind of equate what's going what's to create the most good. Utilitarianism. So there's a lot of ethical puzzles that we do in social sciences. The classic is the trolley uh, dilemma. You know, you have a trolley, which is like a, another word for a train, and there's two tracks. If it goes down this track, it's going to kill like a... 75-year-old grandfather. If it goes down this track, it's going to kill 40 children. It's currently going to go down the track to kill the grandfather. Do you, you have time, do you go and hit the little switch and change tracks and, and save the grandfather and kill the kids instead? You know, that's, that's the dilemma. Do we sacrifice some to save the many? And in society today, we do it all the time. Connor McDavid is worth probably about 10 million Russ McBrides. So, you know, you're telling me that if Connor McDavid and Russ McBride were at the ER at the same time, we'd get the same level of service? You'd be an idiot if you think that. I sat for four and a half hours in the ER to get service in December. Connor McDavid didn't come because he has his own private doctor who comes to his house. Right? Uh, Eurocentrism. We covered, I don't know what this is, but let's finish it up with this last little bit about Friedman, Keynes, Owen, and Smith. Again, we covered Smith. Free economics. Free of what? Free of government. When we are free of government, we will see the overall wealth grow. So what should guide us? The invisible hand of greed. If we all are greedy, meaning I want the best life for me possible, then in a free market where no one's going to come to my aid, there's no CERB, there's no welfare, there's no help from government, then if I want the biggest house, the fastest car I can get, then I better do something of value in that marketplace. That's capitalism. That if everybody's motivated by their own self-interest, we'll all do what we're best at, and the, the economy will be um, most efficient and most productive. And it seems logical. But it also seems cruel because some people, Connor McDavid, 
definitely better at what he's better at than than me. And well, he hasn't done much lately. Nobody on the team's done much lately. I forget the team exists. Don't they have a press conference right now? Did they get a, a, a Vander Kane? Or are they going to bring him in? Are they getting a new coach today? Wasn't there a presser at 10 o'clock? Nobody follows the Oilers. So that's what Smith said. Owen said, this isn't working. It's leading to disparity. So he intervened on behalf of the workers. We already talked about that. We already talked about Marx. We haven't talked about Keynes and Friedman. That's all we have left. So in 1929, the stock market crashes. As it does often. It will soon. 1929, it crashed. And as a result, we had people living in extreme poverty in America. In Tennessee Valley, we had 80% unemployment. Overall, in the U.S., we had 25% unemployment. More like 33 here in Canada. So the government was practicing under Herbert Hoover, the president, freedom from government. But John Maynard Keynes, an economist, said, no, they need freedom through government. This is different. This is more collectivism. This is more, we need to take care of each other. Responsibility for each other. So Keynes said, we need more collectivism in America. We need freedom through government. And that's what FDR introduces. That's the New Deal. And America drifts towards collectivism. They don't become communist at that time. They don't become socialist, but they become more socialist. But then, by the 1950s, 1960s, some within America look into the United States and say, holy, the United States is broken. People become reliant and dependent on government. We become entitled. We expect government to do stuff for us. We've lacked our self-sufficiency, our self-interest. We're lazy. We're apathetic. We don't take an interest in our own, in our own well-being. And because we wait for government to be our savior, we're no longer our own lords. We are on the road to serfdom. That's what Hayek and Friedman said in their solution. Let's go back to Adam Smith. We need free economics. Less government. We are today in Canada at a time of unprecedented level of government in your lives. We are on the road to serfdom. That, that's a fact. And that's the end of the video today.